It's my honor to uh, open the conference this year. I didn't realize that until a few minutes ago, but uh, it's a great honor to be invited to talk a little bit about uh, data and learning analytics. So in this particular talk, I want to focus on the kinds of data that we use and some of the challenges around access to this data, using this data, legal questions, et cetera, that we have when we talk about it. As uh, was said, I'm the director for the Center for the Science of Learning and Technology, University of Bergen in uh, Western Norway. And this is a national center funded directly from the Ministry of Education. And we've been uh, a center since 2016. Bergen is on the West Coast. Here's a few pictures I thought I'd show you. And today, actually, it's now sunny outside. People know Bergen as a, as a wet city, but uh, this particular last year, it's been fairly nice weather. So we're down on the West Coast towards the South part of Norway. And here's some nice pictures from Bergen. So if you haven't been, I welcome you to Bergen. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to talk about what is learning analytics, what data we use for learning analytics, using learning analytics for, using data for learning analytics, and some reflections over my own experience. And I'll use examples from some of our own projects, but also from some colleagues' projects. So let's take a step back and say, what is learning analytics? The most used definition is that learning analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. So here we can see three things. One is that it's about learners and in their contexts, so that it's not just about the individual learner, the behaviors of them, et cetera, but it's also about the context or the environments in which it's going on. And we want to do this so that we can, op we can improve or optimize learning. I don't, I'm not too keen on the word optimizing learning, but we can support learning and the environments in which it occurs. My colleague, Neil Schlater says that this way, learning analytics is the use about data and their students and their activities to enhance education. That's a little simpler definition. But when we're talking about learning, are we talking, learning can be many things. Are we talking about learning as a phenomena? Are we talking about learner behavior, how someone's acting or their behavior in an environment? Are we talking about learning outcomes? Can we show learning through the outcomes they achieve? Are we talking about understanding learning processes over time? Or are we talking about things like self-regulation, motivation, and engagement? And in the learning analytics community, you will find all of these kinds of understandings of learning being uh, researched. We also could talk about teaching as well. So are we talking about the teacher or the instructor behavior? Are we talking about learning design of courses or curriculums or programs? Are we talking about professional development of individual instructors or teachers? Or are we talking about educational practice in general or even educational spaces in which education takes place? And who are the stakeholders for learning analytics? Well, there are many. There's the learners and the teachers, of course, but there could be teachers, tutors or study leaders, school leaders, policy makers, the ed tech industry, the develop ones that develop our tools, and of course, researchers. So all of these different constellations of, of stakeholders and uh, focuses of what we're looking at mean that learning analytics can be many different things. So this is the ISO's visualization of a learning analytics process where we start with some kind of learning activity, we collect some data, we store and process the data, we analyze it, we visualize it, and then there will be some kind of feedback action that goes in and hopefully improves the learning activity. Now, each one of these boxes in itself is a challenge and within the learning analytics research community, you will find people researching different aspects of this. So for example, data storing and processing might have to do with learner record stores, or it might have to do with international standards for exchange of data, interoperability, et cetera. Visualization, it might be about how do people understand what we're showing them, giving them access to their own data, or even not necessarily even 
um, making sure the visualizations are actionable. This is another um, way we could think about learning analytics. And I'll give a little uh, plug for Justin Reich's talk tomorrow at 10 a.m. because he's going to be talking about uh, some adaptive learning systems. And in learning analytics, we combine that together with educational data mining techniques and you can make adaptive learning systems for students. So you're using usually predictive kinds of models and adaptation engines and you are tailoring content to an individual student. But we can also think of learning analytics from an architecture perspective. And this is the JISC learning, uh, learning analytics architecture from England. JISC is responsible for infrastructures for higher education. And they've been working for a long time on learning analytics. And here they have three layers where you have some kind of data collection from many different kinds of tools. You need some kind of data storage and analysis layer where you've got some kind of learner data hub, you've got some analytics predictors or data aggregators, and then you're presenting and helpfully hoping some kind of actions on the top. For example, an alert system or some kind of feedback to a student through an app or a dashboard or other things like this. So some example uses of learning analytics is that we usually say that we're trying to do one of three things, identify patterns, do predictions, or come with recommendations. So when we're in patterns, we're looking at insights into trends, for example, difficult concepts in a course or what courses someone has worked on the killer course, why are people dropping out of this one particular course? Engagement or study patterns, we're looking at different interaction patterns or networks of uh, students, for example, within a um, discussion forum. You can try to understand learning trajectories, determine learning strategies of students. When we're looking at prediction, the majority of the prediction um, have been doing things like predicting trends, pre predicting dropouts from university, or predicting who's going to be successful in particular courses. Looking at early alert or intervention systems, who's you know, these are really related often to trying to keep down um, people from dropping out or failing at universities, trying to retain them. And when we look at recommendations, we see these adaptive type of systems, personalized feedback, recommending per pedagogical resources or pedagogical activities, and or recommending courses or recommending cur curriculum redesign. So there's many, many different ways learning analytics can be used. When we look at it as a research field, we see that learning analytics draws on several fields. So artificial intelligence in education, intelligent tutoring systems, this is from the 70s already, where the goal there was to develop uh, tutors that could give indiv individualized feedback to students. Educational data mining from the 90s began to look at the large sets of data that we could get and draw um, information out of those that could be used often, for example, in intelligent tutoring systems. And then in the 2000s, we have the learning sciences emerge that's blending together um, educational psychology, computer science, information science, instructional science, et cetera, into trying to actually help learning. And then we have the big data analysis and business analytics that has emerged in the last uh, 10, 15 years where we're looking at larger sets of data. And we started to find that we start to have large sets of data but learning analytics isn't just about large sets of data because we often don't have, we have complex data. So we often have data that are between two different or three different um, sources of data. And then it becomes a little bit more difficult and complex to deal with the data. But lots of techniques from the big data business analytics are also relevant as well. And as a research field, we have the Society for uh, Learning Analytics. They have some really nice resources there, if, including a, a handbook of learning analytics, if you're interested. And that was formed around 2000 and be, between 2011, 2013. 2011, we had the first learning analytics and knowledge conference. We also arranged learning analytics summer institutes, which we call LASSIES. Um, they're usually in either Canada or the US for about five days usually in June, the end of June, July, you can go and you can try many different techniques, take workshops, et cetera. And we have some local, what we call local lassies. There's one in Spain, we have the Nordic one, we started in 2017 and there's a lassie Germany as well. 
And then you also know that a field is starting to solidify when you see a journal. And in 2014, the Journal of Learning Analytics appeared. We also have SIGs, and in Europe, we have the Learning Analytics Community Europe, the new SIG for Learning Analytics in Europe, which is just being launched these days. Okay, so let's go now to what kind of data. So Learning Analytics really builds on data. Well, what data are we talking about? If we look at traditional educational research, you usually see that there's some kind of student information, things about what grade you're in, what classes you're taking, your enrollment, your school, your ID, what marks you have. You have teacher-produced information where they give you assignments or they have rubrics that they use to give you feedback, lesson plans. You have student-produced data like the homework you've done, your learning outputs, maybe some self-reflection notes or some peer feedback that you're doing. We have assessment and testing data, tests and quizzes, there's final exams, there's often formative assessment of some kind, behavioral data like attendance and participation, demographic data, age, gender, these kinds of aspects. But now we also see other kinds of data. So when we're talking in, in, in research, we have different kinds of instrument, research instruments like surveys and questionnaires, pre and post tests. We often have interviews observations, those can be on video. Um, we can have interviews that are audio. We can have ethnographic studies or focus groups, many different kinds of things when we're talking about doing research. But we also see kinds of data such as social media, Twitter or Slack data, Facebook, blogs, YouTube data. And then we have the learning environment data, the context and tools. So for example, we have location data, platform or tool data, click stream, or what we refer to as activity data. In the old days, we used to talk about that as log or trace data that tells us things about what assessments you've clicked on, interactions you've had, feedback you've given or get, content, your participation in, in discussion groups, and all that data. This is the digital data that we have that has emerged in the last 15, 20 years. And then we have the multimodal data now. That's things like the video and audio, which we've had, but also location data taken from your mobile phone, for instance, or gaze data taken by eye tracking, gesture data, facial recognition technologies now. We can measure movement, even EEGs or galvanic skin sensors and fMRIs data. We've got examples of use of all of these kinds of data. And that particular data is a subfield of learning analytics called multimodal learning analytics, where we're trying to use this kind of data usually to understand learning as a phenomenon. And then there's other studies, things like looking at air quality or sleep quality, exercise, bringing your health data in and wellness, all of these things, trying to understand the learner and the context in which it's happening. But exactly, we'll look at some studies that are looking at some aspects of these kinds of data in a bit, but there's a lot of data that we're using. There's all these new kinds of tools coming out. You've got rings you can wear that can measure your sleep and your heart rate and things like that. If you're looking at multimodal data, trying to understand engagement or motivation, for example, you've got these nice Toby Pro glasses. You can look at gazing where they're looking on the screen, for instance. We've got all these new kinds of brainwave uh, measurements. My university, we've just got a new wireless FMRI RS system where you can actually, people can move around so you can take FMRI or get, sorry, EG while people are moving around instead of having to stay still, et cetera. And then it's really easy now, um, well, easy and easy, but there are lots of packages to help do um, facial recognition and eye tracking. And again, of course, it's a question as to whether, why do we want all of this data? What do we want to use it for? and all of the issues around that, but we'll come to that in a moment. In 2017, my PhD student and I, Camilla Mishek, we did a state of the field report on learning analytics where we were really interested in what topics people are working on in analytics. And one thing we looked at is what kind of data are the studies using? So we had a hundred studies that ended up in our systematic review and we've observed this kind of data being used. Now we're talking 2017 and multimodal learning analytics was just sort of emerging. So we don't have a lot of the, the newer kinds of data, but we have things like log data, performance data, survey data, demographic data, text data, 
focus group data, pre-post-test data, observation data, and learning design data. And the way to look at this particular map, if we want to see how many studies were using uh, log data, we can see here that there were 60 studies that used log data. And we can see that there were 12 studies that only used log data. They didn't use any other kind of data. So here's another example of a study that used uh, log and performance data and demographic data, text data, and pre and post test data. So here they were using multiple data sets trying to understand some phenomena about, about learners or learning or the learning environments. So we see that there are very often combinations of different sets of data. So now we want to look at using some of this data for learning analytics. So how can we use the, I mean, one of the first questions we have to ask is actually, can we use the data? And here we're talking about privacy and data protection regulations. And usually these make a big distinction between personal data and sensitive data, and also about the reasons that you're going to use the data. So we in Europe have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, which are quite some of the strictest in the world that give us a lot of insights into whether we can actually use data or not. So we need to follow these regulations. And these usually are looking upon whether you can ask, ask for consent to use data or whether you have any kind of obligation to use data. And those are very tied to the national laws. And I'll give some examples in a project that we're doing later on where we're looking at whether it's okay to use consent or obligation. And consent is a little bit easier when you're working with adults or young people that are over, in, at least in Norway, it's over 16. They're allowed to give consent to using their data. Um, but with schools, it's really nice to be able to rest and have a foundation in the national laws for, for example, the education law so that we don't have to ask children. In that case, then it will have to go to their parents to use the data. So it gets a lot more confusing. One of the momentums we have in Norway is that we have got new, we're working the last um, four years on a new digitalization strategy for higher education and research and an action plan. And as part of that, they have identified goals about learning analytics. Learning analytics is a part of teaching and learning. Learning analytics monitors teaching and learning and learning analytics facilitates better research on teaching and learning. And what was interesting was that they have made a suggestion to the committee working with the new higher education law in Norway, what we call the Universitetshögskolas Utvalg, where they have two alternatives that they say learning analytics is a duty, where learning analytics is defined as an obligatory task of institutions related to the quality work that they do as a quality of education. And alternative two is learning analytics as a defined alternative. So they define learning analytics not as an obligatory task, but as something that they say that you should do, but it's not obligatory, but that this still gives them a legal basis for doing learning analytics. So then you can get around some of these consent issues that you have to have. But still, every time we use learning analytics, we need to be cognizant of the data that we're collecting. So we go back to, can we use the data? It's not just the data, it's also confounded by the fact that we're actually using algorithms. And in fact, in learning analytics, we use machine learning and neural net analysis, et cetera. So we're getting into you know, artificial intelligence and these kinds of issues about this combination of data plus algorithms, we have to really reflect over those. So the G GDPR has a built-in privacy by design um, uh, mandate where we have privacy by design. If you haven't looked at it, it's work by Anna Kokovian in Canada in the province of Ontario, the Dutch Data Protection Authority and the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research that's about the development of technologies where you think about privacy at the time of, of uh, developing the technology, it's not an afterthought. And that is built into the GDPR as well. And in Europe, uh, we are guided also by the fact that we should be doing a data protection impact assessment or what we call a DEPA for all technologies that are being used. And in Norway, this actually includes some of the research projects that we have. So I'll come back to that in a moment with one of our projects. 
And then we have issues around the ethical use of data. So privacy and protection are one side of it, but then we actually have the ethical uses. And within the Learning Analytics Committee, we already in 2016 had a paper by Henrik Dreschler and uh, Greller um, looking at um, a checklist for helping you decide if you're doing eth using ethical use of da uh, data called uh, de uh, delicate, determination, explain, legitimate, involve, consent, anonymize, technical, and external. So looking at these kinds of issues. But the thing is, is about anonymizing data, there's a huge discussion as to whether any data can actually be anonymized. And I learned recently in Norway, as long as the original data exists on which you anonymize a data set, then your data is never anonymized. So is it de-identified? Is it pseudo-anonymized? It gets very complicated when you're developing mm -hmm. technology. JISC, we come back to them who had the architecture. They had a code of practice for learning analytics for uh, higher education in, in um, England out, which is a good document if you're interested in those kinds of issues. I know in Norway, we've looked at that when I, the examples I showed you on building on the law, they've looked actually to JISC and got inspiration for how they've dealt with it in England. And we're starting to see the emergence of responsible learning analytics. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson had a talk at LAC this year towards trustworthy analytics. And uh, Tessie uh, serato Pargman and colleagues have had one workshop at LAC on responsible learning analytics. And we're having another workshop in uh, ECTEL in the fall. So there is a very awareness within the field as to what we actually are do doing with the particular data that we have. But then another question is, is, do you actually have the data that you need? And if you think about it, often if we're using a lot, a lot of the work in learning analytics is using the uh, tools that uh, other people develop for us. And then we have data that is saved by those particular um, companies when they make these particular tools. And it's not necessarily the data that we actually need in order to ask the research questions that we have or to give back the kind of feedback we give to the students. So you also have to be cognizant of that and think about that when you're thinking about data. So I'm going to show some examples now of using data around um, teacher and what we call teacher instructor facing dashboards. So this is an example from one of our own projects, my colleague, uh, um, Mohammed Khalil and Gleb Belkarouj is our developer, and they have developed a tool um, for looking at data from uh, Open edX, um, a MOOC. And we are very focused in this particular project on looking at the learning design. So giving develop teachers that develop MOOC courses based on Open edX um, information to help them with the learning design of the work they're doing. We use activity data, there's built-in survey data and there's discussion forum data, and it's based on student consent. And what you can see here is that this is data from um, a course at Oslo Met, one of the Oslo Metropolitan University in Oslo, and all the data has been uh, anonymized, so you don't know where it's from or anything. Um, but here is a very quick overview of event data. When an event data is when people log in, when they've done a quiz, when they've watched a video, when they've done a, participate in a discussion, et cetera. And you can get really quickly a fast overview as to when people are actually working, when there's activity. You can hover over and you can get, for example, on the left, you see uh, event counts. So here with a 14,000 on this particular day, it's a green day because there were 14,208 events and 147 different users. And on the right, we have a blue day where there weren't so many, there were only 311 of, um, events and only seven users. So it gives you very quick overviews. This is another view you can have on the uh, dashboard. And this is look se sequence processing of events. And this is on two levels. This can help you find out that when students are involved, they come in and they do one event and what's the most likely event they're going to do afterwards. And at this level, it's just moving between forums and um, doing a poll or watching a video, et cetera, but you can get it right down to an individual page in your design to find out where people are moving. And sometimes maybe you expect them to go from one, one area to another and they're not doing that. And this can help you understand that. 
Very often you see learning analytics working with video data and what kind of aspects. So this particular course has 18 videos. And if you look very quickly at these three spots, you see something, there's two of them on video four and video 12 are used very much. Video five is hardly used at all. So maybe you wonder, should we even have video five in the course? You can hover over it and click and you can find out particular aspects of a particular video. So this is video 10 that was loaded 246 times, played, paused, stopped, when they sped up, when they seeked for it. And the instructors like to use this to go in and find out why did they all stop? Why did 68, why were the 68 stops at a particular point in this video? Maybe it's some part of that video was talking about some content that was difficult, etc those kinds of aspects. So you can get very detailed understanding of how students are using your videos. And here, this is this where you've paused, where people have paused, where they've stopped and where they've seeked to. Those kind of data give you that kind of insight. This is another interface where you can check activity and you can flag for feedback. So here you see the green is um, uh, indicating uh, um, a lot of activity. The red is a little bit where you're more worried. And on the right, I've just shown you a click here where you can um, click on that and uh, help you decide what kind of feedback you want to give to the student. Maybe if they're not so involved, you might want to ask them for a Zoom call or um, you could just send the message, I see you've been away for a while, etc. But all of this notifications and feedback to students is controlled by the instructor. It's not automated, but it's flagged and then the teacher decides how they want to react on that data. We can move and look at some examples of what we call learner facer dashboards. And Iona Jevitt in her recent uh, PhD dissertation called The Dashboard That Loved Me has done a thorough evaluation of learner facing dashboards with regards to the learner competences they're targeting and um, the impact on learning that they're attempting to address. For example, dashboards aiming to support metacognitive competences will have an impact on the learner's awareness and reflection on their learning. Um, dashboards uh, targeting cog cognitive competence will impact goal achievement and performance. Um, looking at behavioral competence as an impact on their engagement, on their social interaction, or how they seek help. Whereas emotional competence, is, if that's being targeted, then it is looking at their motivation, about their effect. Well, self-regulation, if that's what you're targeting, it has um, impact on your self-regulation processes, on your goal setting, on your monitoring of your learning, etc. So, just because we have a dashboard, you have to think about, it uh, doesn't mean that it's, it's just a dashboard. It can have many different roles in helping a learner and supporting a learner. And what you show them and what you visualize will have an impact on these different kinds of competences. It's a very nice thesis if you want to find it. It's at the uh, Open University in the Netherlands. She's also published a lot of papers as well. Um, Here's some examples of a, uh, of a few dashboards. This one is from a European project called CRIS, which is a dashboard for um, giving you indication of uh, digital competence. And in this one, they're looking at uh, an analyzing users' behavior, progress towards competences, and they use things like student information, test and ass um, assessment results, and also tool use to give you some kind of understanding of how you're progressing to different competence goals um, and also how you are doing compared to the class average and the school average. So that's a typical way to show students something about their progress towards competence goals. This one is from the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. And here they're using student data and performance information from assessments to give the students ideas about how they're doing on all of these kinds of uh, medical performances they have to keep up. So on the bottom, it's about your medical knowledge, how you're doing in different areas. On the top left, they're looking at the weekly checkpoints of uh, how they're doing on different kinds of measurements, and they can get uh, feedback on how they're doing in their progression in their in the kinds of assessments that they have to do within the medical field. This is a dashboard created by uh, some students in my colleague Olga 
uh, Wieberg's master's class where they were trying to uh, design uh, dashboards for themselves about what their own learning is. It, they were engineering students and they were very interested in supporting time management and goal setting skills. And at the top, they get an overview of the uh, different activities they are going to engage with over the eight weeks of the course. And you can see the different color codes that gives them a very quick uh, over, overview of that. And then on the bottom left, um, they get uh, how much time, or on the bottom right, sorry, they're getting how much time they spend um, on uh, different tasks or on their learning goals, et cetera. And on the left, they can go in and they can edit what they've been doing on different tools. Now, this is not implemented. This is a design of something that they would like to know. So if they were going to make this work, then they would have to have syllabus information, for, for instance, the things of the plan of the course, the different activities involved. Here on the bottom, they would need some kind of activity data or self-reported data. And I think they can do self-reported, they were thinking here, because there's a little pen that allows them to enter some data. And on the right, they can get, they would need here activity data and self-reported data as well. And on this example here, they're showing how much time they, they used on their studies versus the time they planned. So that's supporting a little bit of self-regulation and the average time and the class average, et cetera. So here's an idea from some students themselves about things they would like to know about their participation in a course. And they can also have something here about learning goals and they would then have to have different data on how they're progressing towards those learning goals. So that would probably have to come from assignments that they're doing or quizzes they've had, et cetera. Here's another diff completely different kind of learning analytics that we did when we were looking at fire tra uh, firefighter training. And here we were using indoor positioning and motion and time data. So here we had mobile data. Um, we had some positioning sensors and we measured uh, the firefighters' movement um, around um, a house filled with smoke when they're training about how to do searching in the house. So we could do um, uh, measure how long they stood in one place. We had mobiles on their head that could help us um, indicate uh, which direction they were looking in the room and all of these kinds of things that uh, instructors want to know when they're training um, firefighters. In the picture here, there's no smoke in the house, but I can guarantee you when they have the smoke in the house, you see absolutely nothing. So we needed to figure out how to get this kind of data for them because they really don't know what their, what their trainees are doing when they're in the house as they can't see them. So this was an attempt to help them do that. Another way to do this is to uh, look at uh, collaboration and multimodal learning analytics. And this is an example from my colleague, Daniel Spiegel. And this was a very nice European project that was demonstrating here how to collect, what data to collect and how to collect and analyze it when you're looking at collaboration and makerspaces where we've got lots of makerspaces in schools nowadays, but how do we understand what's really going on? And they wanted to understand how collaboration is going on in these makerspaces. And what they actually ended up doing is building some some furniture, specially designed furniture to allow to collect data. And they used computer vision systems to capture and analyze collaboration. So they had cameras that were collecting the students as they worked in groups and built things. They used mobile and web-based tools for students to document what they're doing and to research on the fly coding if they had to make any little coding for a little robot or something. And they used visual uh, programming platform that included sensors, sensors in it to collect data and different kinds of sentiment feedback devices. And then the learning analytics here was logic and reasoning based on all this data that was collected in order to try to understand what's going on. They were using visualizations of the data. And as I mentioned, they've used this specially de designed furniture. Now, this is not something that would happen in a class, but this is a research project trying to understand and improve maybe how people can collaborate better. And very quickly, some of the results, and this, these are slides from Daniel, so um, I really credit him on these. But um, what some of the results was that when they looked at the solutions of the artifacts that the groups were making, they found that the distance between the, the hands of the people and the distance between the learners, which they measured from the top of the head, for instance, as they move back and forth, and the data they collect on the audio, when you put those things together, 
after 30 minutes, they can predict the quality of the artifact that's going to be on the other end. And when they were looking at the problem solving framework or how the students work together, then it was their individual accountability. So how the individual was working and the synchronicity of how the group was working together were strong predictions um, together with, um, there were strong features for prediction with the distance between the hand there as well. So how the distance between the hands predicted the, how the individuals were accountable and the synchronicity of the team. And synchronicity is a important features when features, when uh, you're looking, when they're looking at the screen together or they're looking at something together, for instance, and the physical, physical, physical engagement is a strong feature measured by the distance of the hands together. So that's a very nice study. If you want to see a good study, it's one of the very uh, well-documented studies on how to use multimodal learning analytics in a research um, domain in order to understand collaboration in groups. There's uh, learning analytics for awareness. I'll also give a plug to Ken Holstein at uh, uh, Philadelphia and his project about uh, the Lumio project. If you don't know this one, it's really interesting. The teacher has a pair of glasses and she can see these visualizations on the top of students' heads that's visualizing activity data and the ways that the activity data has been analyzed. And you can see question marks when we don't know um, if the student's struggling. You can see a, a triangle with a punctum if they're doing something or they're not on the software they're supposed to be on. You can see a hand up if the student's asking for help, etc. So the teacher can stand there with these glasses and look out over the class and see what's going on in a better way. So that's sort of a fun project. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about one of our projects where we're really trying to implement learning analytics for adaptive learning in schools and a lot of the challenges that we're running into in this particular project. So this is a project funded by COES, which is our association of municipalities in Norway, the municipality of uh, Oslo and their Department of Education there. And we are the research partner in the project. And what we're interested in doing is monitoring student progress and recommending tasks across a number of vendor tools that students are using in the classroom. So I'll explain that. So here often in classrooms, for instance, we have many different math tools available in Norway that students use in the classroom. And if the teacher wants to know how the students are doing across these tools, they have to go into each tool and look at the dashboards. So the motivation for the project was, there were many, but one of them was, to, can we give them a dashboard that goes across the data across all of these particular um, tools that are being used. And so we get the activity data or the, the data streams that are coming out of these tools and we put them in an LRS. The data comes to us in an international standard called XAPI um, for data activity. And then we use that data and give a, a centralized uh, um, visualization for teachers or for students. So it, I'm going to show you examples from the teacher dashboard at the moment. And when we, as I mentioned before, you have to think about what your dashboards and what your visualization and what information you're giving to teachers is for. And we talk to teachers. So we interviewed 12 different teachers and asked them what they want to know about their students when they're using these kinds of digital tools. And they wanted information at the student level, at the group level, at the class level. They wanted some discipline about the discipline topics they're working on, the competence goals, the exercises, et cetera. And we gave them this tool called MIT Fog Cart, which has the front end, which is a visualization. I'll show you a couple in a moment. And the back end has some analysis and recommender algorithms that work on the learner model that we build for individual students. So we log a profile. In Norway, the national curriculum is based on competence goals. But these competence goals are very, very um, uh, GRU, for example, explore and explain the relationship between a fraction, decimal and percent and use these in mental arithmetic. So we've taken this um, national curriculum and we've made a domain cart or a domain model and all the educational tech vendors, we ask them to tag their data or their items or, or the uh, exercises they have in their tools towards this domain cart. Here's an example for mathematics. We have five main areas, algebra, geometry, numbers, systems, functions, and statistics and probability. 
And the end, the vendors are used to tagging their tools to the competence schools, but it's not fine grained enough to do any interesting analytics with. So we get them to tag it to this right down to the level of which um, verb is being used. And then they can save the tag and it comes in the, like this and they use it and embed it inside the XAPI data that they send to us. Here's some visualizations. For instance, you can have progress towards competence goals. You can have a, an over, quick overview of the knowledge areas they've been working on, either as a, as a tree structure or as um, uh, circles where the size of the circles and the colors tell us how much they've been working on things. And the teachers were interested in what, um, what we call the verbs in our, our national curriculum, things like argumenting, are they comparing, are they describing, are they using, are they measuring, et cetera. So they get a very quick overview of how the students are doing in these different areas. And here's an overview of which particular tools are used in a particular school in, uh, over, the, over the year. You can get a very quick overview of how much the tools are being used. And this is becoming part of an ecosystem for learning analytics in the educational sector in Norway. And this is, uh, was not planned in the beginning, but it's sort of happening. Whereas, as I've shown you, the students log in, they use a tool that goes through a learning record store and into our application. The vendors, they have to tag their data using our fog cart coder tool that I, I showed very, very briefly, I know, but uh, they'll do that. And then the teachers can also log into a planning tool, which helps gives us some ideas about we, what we should be visualizing. And the, the uh, direct route and these last two tools, the planning tool and, the, and the, this search tool have been developed by the um, direct route for um, education. So these are national components. And we can use this search tool to find different particular items when we're going to recommend what students should do next in their work. And the last thing is that's being looked at in this particular project is a billing um, tool. And so instead of schools having to buy a, um, a license for a lot of tools, they can pay on a use model, sort of like we do in, in based on how many of the items the students are using in a particular class. So we're looking at all of this different ecosystem aspect. But what is really interesting is the challenges that we meet here. And I'm almost done in case uh, someone's wondering. Okay, so who owns the data? And you need to have a legal basis for allowing data use, especially when we're looking not especially, but it becomes more complicated when you're looking at uh, children's use of data when you can't really rely on consent. So you need to look at your educational laws, your higher education laws. Is it consent or is it obligatory, as I showed you an example before? So if you have an obligatory, oblig oblig oh, if, if it's obligatory for you to use the data to improve learning, then you're on a different um, type of uh, uh, legal basis than if you're going to have to ask consent. Are the results of what you're going to recommend or to show, are they um, recommended? And a person, a human can make a choice, a student or a teacher, or is it automatic? And that again, makes different rules and regulations. For example, if it's an automatic uh, recommendation, then you have a lot more challenges in order to allow it to be used. We have to do these risk analysis, this deep, as I mentioned before. And in Norway, we have very good experience in doing this with all the stakeholders, the parents, the students, the teachers, the school owners. And if you look back at the In Bloom project in the 2013-2014 in the US that got canceled after a year, it was a wonderful project. But the problem was is they didn't have the support among all of this. One of the problems, of course, not, all, not the only, they didn't have the, you know, the support of the stakeholders involved in the project. So here we bring the teachers and we bring the parent associations and the associations for students, et cetera, in to look at this risk analysis. And you have to have some kind of data handling agreement, things that specify how long data can be stored and is it de-identified soon and analyzed, how long can you hold the data, et cetera. And then another aspect is, can you actually access the data? So now we're talking about if we're really implementing it out in schools or in universities, is it real time or is it scheduled? The quality of the data, do you have the data in the right format? How do you deal with missing data? So all the quality aspects around working with uh, big data and complex data and interoperability of data. And when you're going to do the analysis, it's the same question. A lot of the packages that you can, automatic packages you can use have to have data in a particular format. And 
the certainty on doing the data. Like what, what if you're making recommendations? Are there legal re repercussions for this? For example, if you're automatically giving marks to students, there is a legal repercussion on those marks. Do you actually have the right to do that? Are you certain enough in your data, et cetera, and in your analysis? And then we have the challenges of explainability. Um, what data are you using and what algorithms? And that has to be explained, in, at least in Norway, to all stakeholders. So we have to explain this thing to the parents, to the students, to the teachers, etc. And this project that I've been showing you here, we're actually involved in the Norwegian Data Protection Agency Sandbox for Artificial Intelligence, where we're working together with the Data Protection Agency to find the legal basis for handling the data that we're doing, for doing our DEPA together with the different stakeholders, for finding out the level of transparency or explainability on, on the algorithms that we're using, and how do we communicate this to the students? So what does it really mean to explain a machine learning algorithm that you're using on student data to children, to the parents, etc.? And one thing I want to finish with is that we, we have to think about data literacy and whatever we're doing. And I like Valhae's uh, definition of data literacy that includes the ability to formulate and answer questions using data as part of evidence-based thinking, use appropriate data, tools, and representation to support this thinking, interpret information from data, develop and evaluate data-based inferences and explanations, and use data to solve real problems and communicate their solutions. And there's an awful lot of work we have to do around the use of learning analytics and data literacy. And we have a few projects in this area. And in summary, so when we're thinking of data, we have to think of the access, the ownership of privacy and protection related to it. We have to think about the context in which data is collected. I didn't get into that very much, but a lot of times you can have data without having context information. We have to think about the explainability, not just of the data, but the algorithms using the data. And we have to remember that we cannot reduce people and learning to just the data that we have access to. When we're talking about scalability, so moving from research projects where the majority of learning analytics is done into the field or into implementation as my last project I showed you, we have to think about interoperability of standards, of transferring when you implement something in one context, it's not easily transferable to another context. And we have to think about the impact of our learning analytics. Are they usable? Are people using them? Are they impacting learning outcomes? And that's always the question, people, why should I do this? We want to be able to show that there's good learning outcomes from it. And we have to think about ethics, privacy, and morality around it. And with that, I always finish thinking about, and I steal this from Paul Kirchner, who used this at a talk at the Learning Analytics Conference in 2016. And he used this to highlight the issue of when we're collecting data, we take the data that we can see. We see the data in the light, and sometimes the most interesting data is outside of that. So we have to always be conscious and, and uh, thinking about what kind of data we're using.